All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, so welcome to today's public event on uh, global anti-nuclear activism, past and present. Um, my name is Luc Brunet. I'm an historian at the Open University. Uh, and here at LSE Ideas, I co-direct the Peace and Security Project with Irini Karamuzi. And today's event is hosted by LSE Ideas, and it's co-organized with the Open University, uh, the University of Sheffield, uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center in DC, and the University of Rome, Roma Train. And we've recently set up a new research network with these and other international partners on global histories of anti-nuclear and peace activism. And we've been hosting a conference here at LSC over the last two days on this topic. So this public roundtable uh, is in some ways the, the culmination of those discussions we've been having over the last couple of days. And I think it's fair to say that the topic of today's event um, is incredibly timely. So just last week here in the UK, um, the government announced that it was significantly raising the cap uh, of its stockpile of, of nuclear weapons. Uh, and of course, this comes just two months after the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons entered into force. Uh, and that's now been ratified by 54 countries around the world. And I think the treaty really highlights uh, that the struggle against nuclear weapons is one that takes place at a local or a national level, of course, um, but also internationally or transnationally uh, and globally. And so today we'll be discussing some of the different forms of international action and activism against nuclear weapons. Uh, that have happened really from the 1980s uh, until today uh, to get a better understanding of what's being done and uh, also importantly of, of what lessons can be drawn uh, for activism today. And I'm delighted to be welcoming three uh, exceptional speakers today uh, who've each played a, a decisive role in international activism against nuclear weapons. So our first speaker is Mary Caldor, uh, Professor of Global Governance at LSE uh, and Executive Director of the LSE Ideas uh, Conflict Research Program. Uh, I'm afraid we, we don't have the time to get into her many publications or, and, and her impressive career, um, but perhaps most pertinent for today's discussion uh, is the fact that Mary uh, co-founded the, the Europe-wide movement European Nuclear Disarmament uh, in 1980 uh, and was editor of the influential END journal for many years. Uh, so I think she'll be speaking mainly about END today. Uh, our second speaker is Nick Dunlop, uh, who is currently Secretary General of the Climate Parliament uh, and also a founding member of the World Future Council. Uh, and Nick was previously Secretary General of Parliamentarians for Global Action. And it was in this capacity that he coordinated the Six Nation Peace Initiative uh, in 1984, uh, which brought together world leaders from five continents to work together towards nuclear disarmament. So we'll look forward to hearing more about this initiative. And last, but certainly not least, uh, we'll hear from Beatrice Finn. Uh, so as many of you will know, Beatrice is Executive Director uh, of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICAM, uh, which has really been the, the driving force behind the UN Treaty uh, on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And for ICAM's outstanding work in this area, um, Beatrice, along with Setsuko Thurlow, uh, accepted the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize for ICAM. So we have three very well qualified speakers to take us through uh, three rather different examples uh, of international anti-nuclear activism uh, and what lessons might be drawn from them. So each speaker uh, will have 15 minutes uh, and then we'll open things up for questions and discussions. Uh, so please do uh, type any questions into the chat box and then we can put these to our speakers at the end. So without further ado, I'll hand over to our first speaker, Mary Caldor. Oh, uh... Okay, thank you very much, and I'm really delighted to be on this Zoom. Uh, I think it's really important that people are studying the history of the peace movement, and it was very enjoyable to listen to a history in the earlier session that I had lived through. I was going to start just um, like uh, Luke with this curious decision of Boris Johnson to lift the cap on the number of nuclear warheads, which seems to be an extraordinary thing to do at a moment when the UK is cutting aid from 0.7% to 0.5% of GNI, and when it's only offering a 1% uh, salary increase to national health workers. So what on earth is going on? And not only what on earth's going on, which I'm not going to answer because I really don't know the answer, 
but it hasn't actually produced that much outrage. It seems to me that neither is this decision going to increase Boris Johnson's popularity, nor is it going to reduce it. And it's because somehow there's much less concern about nuclear weapons than there was, say, in the early 1980s. And why is that, I wonder? And I think perhaps part of the reason is that even though there's lots of big noises about China and the Soviet Union, nobody really thinks that kind of war is going to happen. I think it's a dangerous assumption. But if you look at what people are worried about, they're much more worried about the pandemic, about climate change, about racism, about violence against women than they are about weapons of mass destruction. And if I look back to what happened in the early 1980s, which is when I became active, there was a really palpable sense of fear. The dual track decision to deploy cruise and, uh, cruise and Pershing missiles and the decision to renew Trident really made people be really frightened that there was about to be a new Cold War. And I think that fear was added to by the justifications for, Pers uh, for Cruz and Pershing. I mean, people were, may not remember, but the argument was that the US needed to deploy these weapons on European soil um, because then the Soviet Union would retaliate against Russia rather than the United States. And that would reassure Europeans that the Americans would let these missiles off because the Americans could be, needn't worry about the Soviet Union attacking the United States. Now, I know this is an absolutely ridiculous argument, but that honestly, I kid you not, that was the argument. And it was very frightening because they were talking about fighting a nuclear war on European territory. So I think the fear was what produced this mass reaction and anti-nuclear groups literally sprang up all over Europe, but especially in the countries where these missiles were going to be deployed. But I think what was important in terms of what happened was the narrative. And this very much relates to a discussion that was going on in the session before this. In the session before this, people were saying, well, at the beginning, the movement was just about nuclear weapons and it became more political uh, as time went on. It became about being against the Cold War, about detente from below. I actually think the little bit that European nuclear disarmament represented, and I want to stress that it was only a bit of the peace movement, and I want to stress there were arguments, huge arguments and debates, not only with in the peace movement, but with the opposition in Eastern Europe too, and I'll come to that in a minute. And it was those debates that actually educated a whole generation. Um, but what I think is the little bit that represented END uh, was from the beginning political, as Patrick said um, in his response. Um, the END appeal did talk about dissolving the blocks, but I think very significant was that we called for the removal of nuclear weapons from Poland to Portugal. And I remember present at the meeting where we discussed the END appeal. Edward Thompson had done a draft and we discussed it and improved on it. Um, one person, and I'm going to mention only because in the previous section, Ludovica was talking about Isodarko. Uh, there was a scientist called Francesco Calogero who was very important in Pugwash and in Isodarko, Italian scientist, and said, oh no, it should be Atlantic to the Urals because most of the nuclear weapons are in Russia, east of the Urals. And we said, no, we want it to be Poland to Portugal because this is about politics, it's about the removal of the blocks. What I th um, and I think the other point to make is, and again, this is relating to the previous conversation, so apologies to those who weren't present at the 
at the previous conversation was that there was quite at the beginning of the 80s, there was quite a minority of groups that were political in that sense. And they included the Interchurch Peace Council in the Netherlands, and they included the Greens under Petra Kelly. But actually, the mass of the peace movement mostly focused on nuclear weapons. Now, what I want to, um, what I really want to talk about is that what, what I think was encapsulated in the END appeal was to bring together the Western demand for disarmament and the Eastern demand for democracy. And I think whatever people say about why the Cold War ended, was it to do with the economic condition of Eastern Europe? Was it because Reagan went into a new arms rate? Was it because Gorbachev came to power? There are all sorts of people who contributed, but I think it's absolutely undeniable that the peace movement played a very critical role and that we did, some of us did think that the best way to get rid of nuclear weapons, actually it turned out only to be partially true, was to end the Cold War. So I think it was giving the nuclear disarmament movement this political dimension that was so critical. And I just want to say a few words about why I think the peace movement contributed to the end of the Cold War. And I think it did so in two respects. One was on the anti-nuclear side, was the zero option. Um, the Americans proposed the zero option in 1981, and it was actually a direct response to the peace movement. Uh, in fact, I met with one of the key drafters of the American proposal who actually said to me, we got the proposal from your banners that said, no Pershing, no Croons, no SS-20s, because we were emphasizing the disarmament of the whole of Europe. And I think the Americans thought they'd been very clever because Russia, the Soviet Union, as it then was, had far more SS-20s than the Americans had Pershing and Croons. So they were completely confident that the Soviet Union would never accept the zero option. But I think when Gorbachev came to power, he adopted a policy which was directly influenced by all these debates in the peace movement in Pugwash about the idea that we don't need nuclear weapons um, that can kill the world many times over if all our concern is deterrence. And there were, you know, there was defensive defense. There were all sorts of arguments of this kind. And Gorbachev adopted a policy called reasonable sufficiency. And because he'd adopted the policy of reasonable sufficiency, he was able to accept the, start, uh, the zero option. And it was accepting the zero option that opened up the detente policy and that made it almost impossible, I think, for the Soviet Union to intervene in Eastern Europe when the demonstrations began in 1989. So that's one half of the story. And of course, the zero option was only a very small proportion of the total number of nuclear warheads around, but it had this huge political significance because it was the very weapons that the peace movement had been campaigning against. Now, the other element which was discussed in the previous session was detente from below. Um, and this was the idea, which I have to say was present right from the beginning in END and in IKV, that we needed to create a transnational alliance of citizens across the Cold War divide, and we needed to link up with dissidents in Eastern Europe. Actually, I wanted to mention on the IKV, because Rude was saying it came later, at a very early date, the IKV started to make links with the East German churches and the peace movement called Swords into Plowshares, long before many of the other uh, detente connections. But of course, there were lots of 
dissidents who were actually involved from the beginning in END, Stena Tomin and Jan Kavan from Charter 77, for example, who were involved in our discussions. Um, and of course, in my own case, my father was Hungarian and my uncle was a dissident. So I was deeply influenced by that whole world. I think what is true, of course, is that, first of all, it didn't become the central, it didn't affect the rest of the peace movement, as it were. END, as Patrick said, was a small group in Britain until the, late, the mid to late 1980s. I think that Stephanie was completely right in saying what a lot we learned from the dissidents in Eastern Europe. For me, it was my central intellectual formation. I felt that they sitting there having these very high flown conversations had developed a whole language, civil society, which nobody used by the way in those days, anti-politics that kind of expressed what we were trying to do. So we learned a lot from them. But also I think the role of the peace movement from the mid to late eighties was absolutely critical and is very often underestimated. There were all sorts of links across the East-West divide, all kinds of support for small groups, which actually made it, and, and that was linked to our relationship with official peace committees. And it actually made it very difficult in the end to crack down on these groups. And I think it's crucial to remember that many of these groups like freedom and peace in Poland, peace and human rights in, um, in uh, East Germany, West East Dialogue in Hungary that later became Fidesz, weirdly led by Viktor Orban, who is now a dictator. Um, that these groups took played a very key role in leading and organizing the demonstrations in 89 and they were only really possible because of the contacts with the peace movement. I think the other point to make, which for me is almost the biggest point, is again rude from the Netherlands said, oh, there were all these tensions and arguments. That's exactly right. There were huge arguments. There were huge arguments within the West European peace movement about which came first, human rights or peace. There were huge arguments in within the dissident groups about whether the peace movements were fellow travelers or whether they were genuine in supporting democracy. There were huge debates about whether or not we ought to invite members of the official peace committees. And all of those debates were a learning process that I think throughout the 1980s produced a new discourse, the coming together, as several people mentioned, of peace and human rights, into a new discourse that actually became the dominant discourse after 89 in the 90s. Um, it was the discourse about humanitarianism, human rights, civil society. If you think about this country, Britain, uh, Robin Cook's ethical foreign policy was entirely based on this discourse. Robin had been one of the founders of END. Um, and so, and I think this is what this idea, you know, I think during the Cold War and earlier, we thought peace was between nations and human rights was something that was internal to nations. This coming together of peace and human rights was, I think, and it, it's linked to globalization, it's linked to the idea of an international rule of law. All of this was the most important legacy of that period. Now, I have no idea how much time I've got, but I'm just gonna make my last few points. Um, one more uh, minute. What? How many more minutes? Uh, I, I think that's been about 15 minutes, but, but uh, well, so I'm, I'm just going to take finish. the time to conclude. I'm going to finish. I'm going to finish by saying, well, of course, then came 2001, the war on terror, the return of geopolitics. So where are we now? And what's the relevance of this story to now? Well, I think the relevance of this story is that Actually, we're living through now this global pandemic, 
when I think this discourse, which I would summarize as human security, I think that's what really human security is about. And it became popular during the 1990s. And it is about the coming together of peace and human rights. And it's about all the various challenges we face. I think this is a moment when that becomes very important and it becomes very important in two senses. I mean, one is that COVID is an existential crisis like a war, but our heroes are health workers and care workers rather than soldiers. And if they are soldiers, they're soldiers helping to deliver vaccines or do testing. Um, But the other thing is that it's you know, it's long and drawn out, this COVID crisis, and we are discovering that we're actually never going to be able to solve the problem of COVID unless we do it on a global scale. So even though the responses to COVID have been very national, we're beginning to learn, and I think this will happen over the whole period, because I think COVID's not going to go away quickly. We're beginning to learn that we need a global strategy and we need to think in human security terms rather than national security terms. And by that, I mean we need to think in terms of worldwide security rather than in terms of defending ourselves against some anachronistic threat. And I think in particular, I mean, I study conflicts. I study Syria, Iraq, those kinds of conflicts. And what you see in these conflict zones is that COVID is very quickly transmissible because they lack healthcare facilities. There are lots of crowded places. I can go on. People can't stay at home. Um, And actually, if we really want to eliminate COVID, then we need to we need to start really thinking seriously about how to address these kinds of conflicts. And I think that has to mean multilateralism and it has to mean the kind of approach to weapons of mass destruction that the international treaty represents. Um, It's so evident that nuclear weapons violate humanitarian law, they violate human rights law, they, you know, they need to be thought of as something that's illegal, fundamentally. Um, And that's why this kind of approach is very much linked, rather than the classic arms control numbers approach, is very much linked to what one might call a shift to human security. And I think what we have to start coming to terms with is the fact that the whole idea of a major war between states is completely anachronistic. That's how we have to address the issue in a world of COVID, climate change, and all these other problems that we face. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Mary. So now we'll we'll, uh, hand right over to our second speaker, Nick Dunlop. Yes, well, I'm going to um, uh, share my screen, and I'm just hoping that I'm sharing the right thing on my screen here. Um, There we are. So, um, uh, yeah, that that was great to hear uh, a a quick summary of the 1980s peace movement from Mary, who, of course, I know because I was there, played a a really critical role in the whole thing. And uh, and it was a movement that that took place on, on many different levels. Uh, uh, Mary and, and, and her colleagues were leading the grassroots movement in Europe. Um, the same thing was going on in the US where I was based at the time. Uh, the, the project that I've been asked to talk about was a sort of complementary project trying to bring in the neutral, non-nuclear, non-aligned countries as players in ending the Cold War. Um, I was, I was uh, Googling a bit yesterday while getting ready for this and my eye fell on uh, uh, Beatrice's birthday. I noticed two things about it. Firstly, that Beatrice and I have the same birthday, of course, born in different, very, very different years, but nonetheless on the same day. And I'm sure Beatrice has been pointed out to you as it has to me that our birthday is the anniversary of the Russian Revolution. So uh, uh, if there's any astrologers in the audience, I'm sure they can uh, make make a mountain out of that. Uh, But the other thing that struck me was that while I was a 24-year-old young man in New York, uh, 
uh, uh, starting to work on what became the Six Nation Peace Initiative, Beatrice was being born. And um, uh, so this sort of contributes to the feeling that I've had about this event, uh, that I have become a historical artifact, a sort of relic that, get, that can be plucked off the shelf of the British Museum and exhibited to illustrate something that happened a very long time ago. Um, but uh, I'm happy to, ha happy to play that role. And in fact, it's fun, fun to do so for a change because normally I'm pitching the next project, not talking about previous ones. So I, I just want to very quickly to give a bit of background how, how I ended up as a 24 year old guy in New York City, uh, uh, setting up a, a, a parliamentary network to work on peace and disarmament issues. The organization was called Parliamentarians for Global Action. And just to, to go back a decade before that, uh, uh, what got me, we, I, I guess we all have a moment that got us interested in nuclear disarmament and peace issues. For me, it was about 15 years old at a school in New Zealand where I mostly grew up, seeing a, um, uh, a film called On the Beach with Gregory Peck and Ava Gardner and so on. These names on the poster here were among the biggest stars of their day. And it was a film about the end of the world, set in southern Australia. Uh, a wall of radiation was heading south after a nuclear war in the northern hemisphere. Towns to the north were going silent one by one. And a, a bunch of very nice middle class people played by these characters uh, had to decide how to, how to end their lives in, in the end of the world and how to end their children's lives and so on. That made me a, a peace activist. And uh, now, what do I do? I'm... I'm, uh, yeah, I know, but there we are. Um, uh, I have this poster on my wall throughout my university years in New Zealand, uh, one of the atmospheric tests the French did at Muraroa Atoll. Uh, and I was active in the, uh, in the New Zealand peace movement that set the stage to make New Zealand a, a nuclear weapons free zone. And I, I see in the program that there was a presentation earlier about my friend David Longy's efforts to do that. He was a member of our parliamentary network. Uh, after university, my first job was in this increasingly famous building, now that we just had another re failed revolution there the other day, um, where um, I, I worked for a, a Californian Republican congressman, kind of Republican that doesn't exist anymore in the Congress, who'd been the party's leading opponent of the Vietnam War. Um, and before long, I found myself uh, in, an, in a UN office just uh, across the street from UN headquarters in New York, uh, working on setting up this global network of politicians for peace. Um, while I was building up the network, I was on a plane one day flying from Nairobi to Harare, visiting MPs. And um, we were flying past the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro, and it may have been that famous mountain peak piercing the clouds that, that made me think about summits. But it was on that plane, I, I suddenly had the idea, what if, wouldn't it be great if we could get a bunch of world leaders to, um, uh, to come together and issue a joint statement saying, we are ready to demilitarize if our neighbors and adversaries will do likewise under a strengthened United Nations system to keep the peace. And I got up my notebook and wrote this idea down and put it um, in a memo for our next meeting of our Council of Members of Parliament and Members of Congress uh, uh, as one of several ideas for action. They ranked the ideas. They, um, they ranked this one bottom of the list, but I'm not easily dissuaded. So I started organizing visits to heads of government that I thought might be interested and uh, taking two or three MPs with me on each occasion. Um, and uh, our, our first, uh, our first uh, sort of big expedition in search of presidents and prime ministers who, who might like to sign up was going east, uh, west to east. We started in Dublin, uh, uh, didn't find the Irish Taoiseach very interested. We went to Madrid, didn't find Felipe Gonzalez, the Spanish leader at that time, very interested. Things got more interesting when we got to Rome. And uh, we went to see the Pope 
and talked to him and talked to his foreign minister who said, you know, we've looked at this. I, each time I wrote a memo to the leader beforehand and sent it through their UN ambassador or some other, some other way. Uh, the foreign minister said, this is the best idea for world peace we've seen in, uh, in years. And if you can organize the group of leaders, the Holy Father will issue a statement of support, which he did when the day came, as did the World Council of Churches, uh, the uh, senior uh, mufti or whatever his title is in Cairo and so on. We got a lot of religious uh, support. Um, but the key meeting came shortly after that on the same trip with not the simpleton on the left here, but the uh, very petite and very powerful woman who's trying to be nice to him. Um, for those of you who are too young to recognize President Reagan, he's the guy in the suit. Uh, boy, was he stupid. And um, uh, we sit down in Indira Gandhi's office, uh, just with her, no staff present. Uh, she ran India as uh, uh, pretty much single-handed. And we started our little song and dance. And she said, don't, uh, don't go on. Uh, I've read the memo. I support this proposal without hesitation. How can India help? And at that point, we knew she was chairman of, chair of the non-aligned at the time. She was one of the top three or four leaders in the world, as any Indian prime minister is, but she in particular. We knew we had an initiative uh, uh, on our hands. So we went around, recruited other leaders, and the result in the end was, uh, was this group meeting in Delhi in 1985 for their first summit meeting. So on the right, you had Indira's son, Rajiv Gandhi, because she... Although we met with her a few times in the run-up to this to organize it, shortly before we met, she was assassinated. Um, uh, next to Rajiv, we've got Prime Minister Papandreou of Greece, the one member of NATO who was prepared to step out of line on nuclear disarmament. Uh, president Miguel de la Madrid of Mexico, Julius Nyerere, the president of Tanzania. The Sikh chap was the president of India. He was there, we were in his garden, he was there for the photo opportunity, but uh, he wasn't part of the group. Uh, Olaf Palma, the Swedish Prime Minister, and President Raul Alfonsín of Argentina. And this event went global. This was on, we didn't have the internet in those days, but this was on the front page of the New York Times, a picture of them in the garden there. Uh, it was on the front page of the London Times. It was on the front page of Asahi Shinbun, the world's largest newspaper, and all over the world. It was, it was uh, a big story. And I think one reason why it hit, it, it hit, um, uh, sort of hit, hit a nerve in the world uh, was partly the language we were using. Um, I don't normally put words in PowerPoint presentations, but, but I wanted to just put a, this little passage from a two page Delhi declaration, as we called it. I was the, um, uh, the, 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 the draftsman for the group. Uh, but working with input from the different governments. And this passage had input from uh, the representative of the uh, Argentine president, who himself was a minister, and, but also the son of a famous Argentine writer. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, 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 like every innocent prisoner, we refuse to believe the execution will be carried out. Um, this is the kind of language heads of government do not usually put in their, in their joint communiques. You know, the, every day we remain alive is a day of grace, as if mankind was a prisoner waiting to be executed at any moment. So um, uh, I think that was part of it, that, that we were using strong language. What followed was um, uh, uh, soon after that, Gorbachev came to power in the Kremlin. And that, that of course, changed everything. And, and make no mistake, the guy who ended the Cold War more than anyone else was Mikhail Gorbachev. But we helped just as the grassroots peace movements played a very important role. Uh, and, and one role we played was helping Gorbachev to grapple with his hardliners in the Kremlin. So for example, there was a moment when one of the key issues was, apart from the European short, medium, medium range missiles, was uh, uh, stopping nuclear testing. And Gorbachev was trying to get the Reagan team in the White House to respond to a unilateral moratorium he put on Soviet nuclear testing. The Reagan people didn't want to stop. They refused to respond. Gorbachev was under a lot of pressure from his hardliners. At one point, he announced an extension of his moratorium in a letter to us, to our group, which he then published in Pravda, the Soviet newspaper. 
we were able to facilitate independent uh, uh, verification by a group of American seismologists working for an American NGO, the Natural Resources Defense Council, who went and put seismometers around the Soviet test site. Um, so we were able behind the scenes to do a lot of things that, that contributed. Uh, one of the pleasures of those five years of my life was making friends with Rajiv Gandhi. Uh, who was a very likable guy. And of course, being the Prime Minister of India, he was the, the heavyweight in the group, because India is India. So for example, when he went on a state visit to Washington, uh, being wined and dined by Reagan and everyone who mattered there, he really put it on the agenda to say, I think your Star Wars plan is stupid. And they took this very seriously and, and organized all kinds of briefings uh, by the Secretary of Defense and the Joint Chiefs of Staff and so on to explain to Rajiv Gandhi why Star Wars was great. And at the end of it, he said, I still think it's stupid. Um, so uh, uh, he played a key role in this. We, we had a, a second meeting in uh, Ixtapa on the, on the Mexican coast in 1986. Each time we, we brought the group together, we uh, issued another <laughs> declaration, but a lot of it was happening in correspondence between the group and the leaders of the US and the Soviet Union and in bilateral visits. There was a, a planning group uh, made up mostly of the top foreign policy advisor to each leader um, that would meet every two months for the five years we ran this project. This was a meeting in Tanzania and you can see President Ureri sitting in the front row in the middle there. You can see a very young Nick Dunlop sitting <laughs> standing at the back. Uh, and two, two, two along from me was my friend Oliver Grimson who uh, Mary knew well, I guess, and, and uh, uh, then an Icelandic member of parliament, later for about 20 years, president of Iceland. There was a group of uh, mostly young legislators from different countries who, who uh, played a key role in pulling all this together. Congressman Tom Downey from the US, Senator Sylvia Hernandez from Mexico, Raylas Terbeek, a Dutch member of parliament, uh, Aaron Tovish on our team in New York played a key role. He'd been thinking independently about the role of neutral nations. We had two wonderful colleagues in, our, in, in New York, Regina Monteconi and Betsy Hurwitz, who also played an important role, as did many others. I didn't do this on my own by any means. So um, uh, then we had a, uh, a third summit meeting in Stockholm. By then, Ingvar Carlsson in the center of the group there uh, was the Prime Minister of Sweden, uh, Olaf Palmer, having been assassinated. I'll tell you an anecdote from that meeting, which is sort of relevant, I think, for, for, for the peace movement even today. Um, there was a press conference where the group was up on the, the stage. The Ar Argentina was represented. Alfonsín couldn't make it, so uh, it was the foreign minister from Argentina, but the rest of them were there. And um, big press conference, big auditorium, and a Swedish journalist stands up and asks, uh, it seems to be rather dangerous to be part of your group. Indira Gandhi's dead, uh, Olaf Palmer's dead. Is this something to do with your group? And the prime minister of Sweden said, quite frankly, we don't know. That was his only answer. There was stunned silence in the room. You could have heard a pin drop. And later that day, um, we had a meeting of our planning group and uh, in which I always participated with one or two of the MPs. And um, uh, on the agenda, Hans Dahlgren, who last time I saw him was still a minister in the prime minister's office, uh, was chairing the meeting. And um, uh, he said, right now we, on the agenda, we have a proposal from an external source that uh, we should work on conventional disarmament as well as nuclear disarmament. And there was silence and the Greek advisor piped up and said, uh, well, I think if we took up conventional disarmament, I would be afraid for the lives of our leaders. And there was no further discussion. Everyone agreed with that and we, we moved on. Uh, we can perhaps come back to this in the discussion. I'm almost done, Luke. Uh, I'll just say a couple of other things. Um, firstly, uh, it was fun. Uh, the, uh, uh, and although we, we didn't get a prize as big as the one Beatrice had the pleasure of picking up a few years ago, we got the Indian equivalent, the first Indira Gandhi uh, Prize for Peace and Development, which is the Indian Nobel. It's financially comparable. Nobody ever heard of it outside of India, but in India, it's worth quite a lot to have uh, been a co-recipient of the first, first of these. But the second year, they gave it to Gorbachev, in fact. Um, and... Uh, 
uh, that was all good. But at the same time, there were frustrations. And for me, the frustration really was that, that uh, uh, the governments were less radical than I was, to put it simply. I can expand on that in the discussion if we, if we have time. But um, just finally, like Mary, just to bring it up to the present, I, I was just going to say, for me, the lessons I learned in those five years have been very helpful ever since. I've been working for many years mainly on climate change, which I really see as also a peace issue, uh, having hundreds of millions of people fleeing their homes because of drought and heat waves and so on in a world bristling with nuclear weapons is a really, really bad idea. So to me, it's not much of a shift, it's two sides of the same coin. But um, we're now organizing an initiative for the Glasgow Climate Summit in November this year called the Green Grids Initiative, which is about building the new infrastructure we need, including cross-border continental scale grids to trade renewable energy, to connect everyone to the best locations for wind and solar, which of course is also a peace issue because it's sort of linking, um, uh, linking often uh, countries with bad relations as neighbors often have uh, together with, with transmission lines. But um, uh, that's looking promising. The British have taken it up as a, a, hoping it'll be a major outcome from, from the summit. Britain, of course, is the, 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 uh, the presidency of this next COP26. Um, but uh, just this week, I was reminded of that moment with Indira Gandhi when another rather petite and immensely powerful woman who plays a huge role on the world stage um, uh, sent us a letter. Uh, confirming that the EU, that we can count the EU in with the Green Grids Initiative and, and you know, setting up a discussion of how they can contribute. Uh, and I thought, you know, if, this is another moment where, because Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, has said yes, we have a major global initiative on our hands, and I think we've got a real chance of getting the Biden administration involved at this point. This also links to Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, who's talking about one sun, one world, one grid. So it started with a discussion with him. Last slide. Again, I'm breaking my rule here, but I wanted to share with you uh, a passage, the final, the final paragraph from a speech that the great, speaking of Nobel Prizes, the great Nobel Prize winning Colombian novelist, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, gave at our Mexico summit. And it was the most moving speech I've ever had the privilege to hear. Uh, I've listened to Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, but this one I was there. And um, uh, it is, it is uh, still when I read it, it makes me immensely sad. Um, uh, I, I, I still find it beautiful. And I'll let you just read it for a moment. Let us discover and make known for all time those guilty of our disaster and how deaf they were to our cries for peace and with what barbarous inventions and on behalf of what petty interests they expunged our lives from the universe. He preceded this with a very beautiful passage saying, if we are destroyed in a nuclear holocaust and in the future some salamander, he's, I'm now paraphrasing what he said, these aren't exactly his words, but he said, if in the future some salamander of evolution once again climbs the tree of life to become a beautiful woman, let us leave a sign that we do more than anger. But I have to say that 40 years on, I'm still angry. I'm still angry that our governments could even think about letting this happen. And uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop and stop sharing my screen. Great, thanks very much, Nick. Uh, so now we'll hear from our third and final speaker, Beatrice Finn. Thank you. Um, thank you so much to Mary and Nick. It's extremely interesting to, to hear from, your, from you and your perspective on, on really the, the kind of historic connections. Uh, and I don't know, I just got a very sort of, it's a nice feeling to feel a part of this kind of his history in, in many ways and how it continues today. Um, 
I wanted to start by, you know, first, you know, sometimes nuclear disarmament, anti-nuclear activism has uh, a bit of an unfair reputation of not having succeeded. That we see it almost as a black and white game of winning or losing that only zero nuclear weapons would be the only acceptable um, result of a successful campaign or a successful push. Um, and it's quite interesting because we don't look at other issues in the same way that if there's been one human rights violation anywhere in the world, then all of the human rights work we've done is, you know, pointless. Uh, it's a very kind of a black and white mm. way of looking at weapons. Um, and I just want to kind of highlight that the, the fact that we haven't seen nuclear weapons being used um, in war, for instance, 1945, is also a huge victory of the anti-nuclear weapons movement. And the work that people have done since nuclear weapons were invented and first used uh, has really also contributed to holding back that worst case scenario uh, and preventing that from happening. And what we should be really enormously grateful for all of the work that has been done for activists. Um, a lot of people will say that you know nuclear deterrence that prevented the you know world from have war from happening and things like that. But I also think that you know activism has made nuclear weapons use really uh, unacceptable uh, and raised the stakes for leaders uh, and constantly pushed them and educated them and and made it difficult for them to use it. I don't have that much faith in 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 military leaders and in government leaders that they they would just you know not use nuclear weapons on their own because they they thought about it they don't want to i think that it's really a, a thanks to the work of so many people uh, and also to think about proliferation uh, how the fact that even despite the fact that the nuclear arms state still tells us every day how important you are how powerful you are when you have these weapons we have still prevented so many countries from going that direction and still have this kind of barrier that it's it's bad, you shouldn't be doing that. They predicted that 30, 40 countries might have nuclear weapons uh, in the 60s. And actually only nine countries have developed them. And that's actually a really, um, we should take that also as a victory. Uh, and, and the fact that we have prevented so many countries from thinking that that's an acceptable option. So I think it's really important to not see activism and this kind of work as about losing or winning. It's not a game. Uh, it's constant ongoing work that you know needs to be done no matter if it's, um, if, if, if we feel like people are listening at the, that moment or not. Uh, I've seen a lot of comments and not just on nuclear weapons, but also on other issues. For example, the this past year when we talked about and a lot of anti-racism activism is like, defund the police is a bad slogan. It's not marketable. You should have done something else. Like it's a PR campaign that we're doing and not just uh, activism work because it's the right thing and because we have, this is what we believe in and this is what we're doing. So I, I think it's really important to keep that in mind as we talk about this issue. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about ICANN and the TPNW and sort of the, the work that we are currently doing. It's uh, hard to draw lessons from things that are ongoing and happening right now. Uh, so it's just sort of a little bit of my, my perspective on, on the work that we've done so far. Um, I think one of the things that the founders of ICANN identified early was really the need to have a very clear message and gathering a lot of different types of activism behind a big push. Um, and if you just, if I could just compare with myself, who you know are very supportive on other causes, like climate, for example, for example, a huge thing, um, really passionate about that. But I am not the expert, right? So for me, looking at the climate change, um, what needs to be done, what needs to happen, it gets really overwhelming. There's this solution, there's that solution. Sometimes they're very competing, um, and I think that what we identified in ICANN was really the need to have this very clear message. Um, that people can rally behind. And one of the difficulties doing that is of course that everyone has their own analysis of what the problem is. And everyone has their own constituency and their own kind of perspective uh, on climate change, for example. Um, is it, you know, is it plastic? Is it oil? Is it meat consumption? Is it this, is it that? And you can kind of governments and people in power 
can play those actors against each other to avoid doing anything. So what we really tried to do in this coalition work was to allow organizations to join ICANN and be a part of a big push, but still keep their own identity and their own um, wider analysis of the problem and their own perspective. And I think that that's really key for allowing a very diverse community to be able to still be themselves and be authentic to what their, their founding mission was and their beliefs, but able to focus on a very kind of narrow push uh, as a part of a wider coalition in this instance. So I think that that's, that's been a, um, a key part of our work to really make it possible to unify in this small part of the work, but still not lose completely and not demand that everyone gives up the whole wider scope of work that they're doing, whether that is work on say nuclear energy, for example, or that is work on other weapons issues, or if that is dismantling the military system as a whole, to sort of kind of find a, a sort of a sliver of this perspective that we're working on and make a big push and unify that. And I think that when we unify in civil society and when we manage to rally people behind one clear action, that's when civil society is really strong and really effective and can really push governments uh, far. Another thing that I think has been extremely important and something that I also see um, in part of history of which initiatives around nuclear weapons have been successful is really the hu human stories and the humanitarian perspective. The kind of idea that this is, this is why we're doing this job. It's not a um, strategic stability exercise. It's not about counting missiles. It's really about preventing immense human suffering and highlighting the stories of what would happen if these weapons are used, highlighting the, the impact on, on, on people uh, as a fundamental part of the campaign. And what we discover is really that that's what people, that's what moving people. Nick, you talked about this movie, for example, the ability to kind of think about this weapon in reality is instrumental for it to be motivating for people to act. And we've seen that, I think, with a lot of the way governments, especially in particular nuclear armed states, the way they prefer to talk about these weapons is devoid of that human kind of perspective and human angle on the issue. So in order to be successful in this work, we have to have the human centric narrative, the what we call the realist perspective really on nuclear weapons, what happens in reality when these weapons are used to human beings, to our bodies, to our cities, to our countries. And that focus really, what we've discovered makes people act and it makes people feel like they have a reason to do this work, that it's actually a real issue, a real weapon and with real consequences. And the third one, the third kind of thing that I think has been really important for us and a, a key part in the, in the success um, of our work to create this treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons has been to create a sense that everyone has a role to play in this work. A lot of times when we talk about nuclear weapons, we talk about the leaders of the nine nuclear armed states and we talk about the militaries of them and it's very disempowering for people to, to talk about Kim Jong-un or Putin or Boris Johnson feels very far away from anything that I can impact as, as, a, as a person. So what we're trying to do is to provide opportunities and framing the work in a way that people feel like they matter, uh, not just the leaders. Uh, this is not just an issue that will be solved by getting the US and Russia together in, an, in a negotiating table, but really everyone else who is, who is complicit in the problem and everyone else who plays a role in this problem. For example, we worked a lot with putting a spotlight on the nuclear allied states, the countries that are part of, if there was nuclear war, they would be part of you know, the military operations of using these weapons. They might be stationing nuclear weapons on their territory. Germany, for example, or Netherlands or Belgium, their military would drop weapons of mass destruction on, in, on civilian populations, mass murder civilians, and try to put that kind of in the spotlight. So it's not just an issue of Putin and Kim Jong-un and, and Boris Johnson and Macron, for example, but it is actually an issue for everyone. And there's more countries and problems that are up in this. We put a focus on the weapons companies, for example, that have these huge contracts 
that um, are, are fueling the economy of nuclear weapons and where huge investments are being made and huge budgets are being spent from tax money on these weapons, on the banks that lend these companies money, for example. And, you know, we've been looking also at different stakeholders uh, to make sure that it's not just the people in the nuclear arms state, but also non-nuclear arms states have a role to play, that artists have a role to play, photographers, university students, bankers. There's all these ways where people could have an impact on this issue. And I think that's one of the lessons we've also learned on from, for example, the climate change movement, where people feel much more personal agency over the issue and then in nuclear weapons. And I think that's very needed in order to feel like we can contribute. People don't get motivated by just looking passively at some leaders and hoping they will change. People get motivated when they can do something and they feel like they have agency to change. So I think those three things have been really instrumental in creating our movement and creating the sense of progress and how we are approaching this. And the, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons has really been kind of trying to, to put that into practice. Um, one of the advantages of this treaty is that it has a very clear and simple message of banning nuclear weapons. It's simple enough that anyone can understand what that means. Banning nuclear weapons, ban the bomb is going back to kind of the the, um, the, the origins and a lot of the initiatives on nuclear weapons have been so complex and hidden in so much abstract language that people haven't really like cutting off fissile material production. What does that even mean? But banning the bomb, banning nuclear weapons is very clear. At the same time, it's not abstract. It's not, it, there's a concreteness to it. It's a very specific action that you have to take. So it puts also governments, it's clear for the public, but it puts governments um, it, it sort of puts the pressure on them that, you know, if you, this is not just nice words, right? This is also a concrete legal measures that you can be in on or you are out. And if you're in, you're part of the solution. If you're not, if you're out, you're part of the problem. So it's had this kind of advantage of being very simple, but very um, kind of a, a real sort of like getting to the to the basic point, uh, part of the problem of nuclear weapons, that we've still had these weapons being legal and acceptable for some countries to have. And, you know, we've been able to rally around, you know, over 600 organizations in ICANN now in over 100 countries uh, around that kind of message. And, and that has really helped us being able to be effective uh, across continents, uh, in parliaments, uh, in all these different places that can have an influence on this. Um, and of course, also the treaty, um, it really is centered around the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons. That's how the whole process started. Uh, the whole process from the beginning has been very, has involved survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also nuclear test sites. It has involved the emergency responders, like doctors, the Red Cross, the United Nations relief agencies and humanitarian system, really focusing on the practical, not the theoretical. Uh, what happens, you know, the whole starting point of this treaty was just to have expert conferences with governments. But what happens today when a nuclear weapons goes off? What happens to the cities? What happens to the hospitals? What happens to the doctors? To really make it that. So the whole kind of humanitarian initiative um, and, the, and that perspective has been the, the, the kind of driving force behind this treaty and what made it really get traction, both with civil society and with governments. And the third way that we do this is, is that, you know, using the treaty and using this movement to empower new types of actors. First, to empower civil society, um, and activists feeling that they had an ability to contribute to these kind of conversations, but also to empower the, the countries that have very often been ignored in this field, the non-nuclear armed states, African countries, Pacific Island countries, uh, Latin American countries. It really has contributed to changing the power balance around this and allowed both countries and individuals in the countries and in civil society to feel agency and feel like they they are able to influence things. Um, and having a majority of these sort of non-powerful countries and uh, the non-nuclear armed states to stand up and take control of the situation and ban the weapon that the most powerful countries in the world have and sort of, you know, part of the, their status as permanent members of the Security Council, 
I mean, it's not just radical, it's in a way a kind of a revolution also in international law and in, in international relations in, in the dip diplomatic system to have that kind of um, power dynamic shift and something that I think is not just relevant for the nuclear disarmament issues, but it's going to be relevant for international diplomacy and international relations. And I think that the reactions from these nuclear weapon states uh, has shown how intimidated they have been by that. And as in any dictatorship, uh, you're only powerful as long as the big majority allows you in a way. And when they really mobilize and, and take a stand and, and won't acknowledge that, that power anymore, you lose it. So I think this is, you know, this has been really part of the, the way that we worked. Um, and of course, I think that today there's so many issues on, on the agenda for people. People are overwhelmed and really um, almost burnt out by the number of issues that we have to fight with today and have to take a position on and have to get engaged and have to educate ourselves on. And it's really hard to get people to focus on nuclear weapons. Absent of a, an accident or an intentional nuclear use, I think it's going to be very, very difficult. So, of course, I think that that doesn't mean we, we are, are powerless and that we have to wait for something else to happen. I think we also are able to, to work in a new way. Activism is changing constantly. Uh, campaigns are also have to adapt into new methods. And I think that this is an, is an issue that might not even need that huge mobilization all the time. Uh, it needs to connect with other movements though. Um, so really, I think that, you know, two things that are going to be really important for us to, to move this issue forward, to utilize the treaty as a way to take another step towards nuclear disarmament. It's really uh, first to utilize this kind of moment where we have right now, where people are really challenging um, what, what security is. I mean, I think that this year has really highlighted that, you know, the big crisis came and the military and our weapons didn't do anything to save us. Um, and this is just uh, the start of a new security situation with climate change, with all of these other issues that we're facing that's just going to get more like that. And the military is going to be helpless in those situations. And it was the nurses and the delivery people and the grocery workers that have kept us, you know, functioning in society during this year. And I think that's something that we really need to utilize. Um, and I also think that there's all these other issues that not just we need to stand in solidarity, but also make sure that nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction, and also the militarization in general is connected to the anti-racism movement, the feminist movement, the global health movement, economic justice movement, and, and not just in an abstract, but in a very concrete way. I mean, I think that the, the way that, you know, just this last two weeks where we had a huge kind of wave of solidarity against um, racism, um, against anti-racist movements for, against, for example, um, people of Asian descent, and to connect that with the new Cold War against China and the way that some of our politicians and decision makers are talking about Chinese people, about the Chinese government, about you know, the feeding that and, and connecting those issues. Um, how, for example, a, a huge bailout package in the United States that's supposed to be give COVID relief to businesses includes enormous amount of money for nuclear weapons from weapons companies you know, blank checks, basically, spend whatever you want right now on weapons at a moment where people can't, you know, feed their children. In the UK, uh, kids weren't allowed to keep their school meals, but the government is going to spend a huge amount of money on, on nuclear weapons. Uh, so I think that we have to connect those things and make sure that we, we don't let nuclear weapons, we don't let weapons or the military in general be isolated. As a, as a separate issue that doesn't connect with all of these other issues that are going on, but to really drag it back in to these conversations, not as asking people to leave those issues and work on nuclear disarmament, but to really make the links in a genuine way and talk about how all these things are connected. And there are decision makers that are saying that this is for protection, but it actually harms people and it actually steals resources away from the real protection that we need today.
So I, I do feel, uh, even though it might feel, you know, frustrating, especially I can imagine in the UK right now, where we had a quite a shocking news. And I can understand that it feels like we're not getting anywhere. But I think we also are really in a huge moment right now where we can utilize the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Uh, the fact that we did not have up until now a global ban on nuclear weapons, and now we have it, is a huge victory. Um, and to utilize this moment in time where we have, you know, people are being very receptive to questioning what security is, who gets to decide, and who do these people look like, um, and who do they represent, the people who decide what security is today, and are they actually representative of the people? Um, so I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to stop there. And thank you very much. And looking forward to the question. Great. Thank you so much uh, to, to all three speakers for, for three fascinating talks. So um, to, to everyone in the audience, please do um, type any questions in um, uh, sort of in the Q&A uh, box and we can put those to the speakers. Uh, so we have a few already. So I'll, I'll pick out maybe two to start. And I, I can put those to our speakers uh, and that'll give everyone a, a chance to, to add any more questions. Um, so the first one uh, says it's a question for Beatrice, but I, I think this, this may also be uh, relevant, uh, especially for, for Nick. So, I mean, it'll be open uh, to, to anyone. Um, and that's how can civil society interact effectively uh, with MPs to put pressure on governments? So, for instance, do you think that the motion passed by the Spanish parliament could contribute to change the Spanish position towards the TPNW? Uh, so that's the first question. And then I'll, I'll uh, group together uh, a second question. Um, and this is from, uh, from Mark, a student in the Netherlands. Um, and so the question is, is specifically, um, did uh, nuclear disarmament in Ukraine leave Ukraine more vulnerable to, to Russian aggression? And, and I suppose the broader question here is, um, are, are nuclear weapons actually effective in deterring kind of conventional uh, warfare? So I'll, I'll put those two to our two speakers. Uh, I don't know who wants to answer first. I'm happy to go on the first one yes. that was directed to civil society in parliaments um, and just to, um, especially on the TPNW, I think it's it's massively important and really how we're going to change things. And I think we've seen over and over again how politicians um, are very receptive to what people say and think. And, and that's how we, how we get them to change. But these governments are not going to change on their own. You need that kind of external pressure. Uh, Netherlands was the only NATO country that participated in the negotiations of the TPNW. And they did that because parliament voted and made a decision that you have to go. And the government didn't really want to, but they were forced by their parliament. And Belgium, for example, was um, outlawed cluster bombs in its parliament before the treaty negotiations even started, as the, you know, just, just I, I'm not going to say randomly, there was activists working on it very much, but it was quite taken by surprise from a lot of other countries that the parliament just did it. The government and the military wasn't even prepared for it. Uh, and I think it's extremely important to have that, you know, connection between the people's will and the, the decision makers. I think the people who sit in the military, they don't get rid of their weapons voluntarily. They want to keep all options on the table. So it has to come from the elected officials. So I really think that we can... Um, we can, you know, we need to work very, um, very focused on, and particularly in Europe, on parliamentarians. And I think that we have a lot of opinion polls, for example, that back up, uh, that says that the public is very supportive of nuclear disarmament. The public is supportive of the TPNW and wants their governments to join in. The, the public in the European countries that host American nuclear weapons don't want them there. They want them out. But... It's one of those things where the public isn't expressing it clearly enough, right? Like there's no consequences right now for the politicians to not do it. And then you have the defense ministry and you have the NATO colleagues in Brussels and then it gets difficult for them and it's better to not do it at all. So we have to take that public opinion and, and, and kind of materialize that into pressure, into concrete actions. And, and sometimes it doesn't actually need, it doesn't need 10,000 people demonstrating. It just needs a couple of people to constantly push and constantly remind them and speak on behalf of all of that, all of those people. Uh, so I think that it's really important to, to be loud and to constantly remind the politicians that this is what we want. This is what we want. And, and, and I, I think on the, on the Ukraine side, 
Um, I mean, you can argue on this a long time. I think that well, a lot of people talk about, you know, that it was a mistake that Ukraine gave them up and you kind of disregard Russia's role in this as well and act like there would be nothing in between that decision and now. Uh, and I think that if we, first of all, are we confident that Russia would have been happy to have a nuclear arm in Ukraine after, after Soviet fell? And that that wouldn't have led to conflict and maybe war, maybe nuclear use in the meantime. That, you know, I think that we, we sometimes assume that if you have nuclear weapons, everything will be fine forever. Uh, and not thinking that having nuclear weapons is an enormous risk for your own country. It makes you a target. It, it, it fuels, I mean, like the, in the North Korea crisis, for example, we were very, have been very close to war with, between the United States and North Korea because of nuclear weapons rather than against it. So, you know, and of course you can say that, well, it hasn't happened yet, but it hasn't happened until it happens. And when it, and if, if Ukraine had kept nuclear weapons against the will of Russia, that would have probably led to a, a quite a complicated situation that could have led to war, maybe even nuclear use. Maybe Ukraine wouldn't be, exist today then. Um. Nick, go ahead. Yeah, I'll leave Ukraine uh, to to Mary because she she's she she's personifies the bridge between East and West that helped. Uh, she was a bridge between East and West that helped to end the Cold War. So that's her. Uh, that, that's something she'll know a lot about. Uh, just on, on the MPs, though, I, that's something I know a lot about because uh, I've been working with with members of Parliament all my life and. Um, my strategy has always been based on working with a small handful in each parliament who do care and are not corrupt uh, and are not just careerists. But on any issue, whether it's peace and disarmament or climate change, it's a very small handful in each parliament. You can often count them in e even in a large parliament on the fingers of one hand. So how do you move the rest? They can do a lot, they can do a lot. And I, I think our Six Nation Peace Initiative was an example of what a small number of parliamentarians and, and staff could do. But um, uh, I, I would say not only that civil society must interact with MPs and apply maximum pressure to them, uh, uh, I, would, I would add to that, that is the only thing that's going to get the politicians moving on nuclear disarmament and peace. It is the only thing. Most politicians are in politics as a career. They will only prioritize this issue if they think it's going to help win them votes and support and if they're hearing it from their constituents. And the reason that, it, that there aren't as many politicians active on this issue today is they're not hearing as much from their constituents as they did in the 1980s. In the end, politicians are running for re-election all the time. And when you write a thoughtful letter to your member of parliament, one of your representatives, expressing your concern about the nuclear uh, 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 you know, about the, 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 the mortal threat that nuclear weapons pose to all of us, that is a message that this issue may influence your vote. Uh, furthermore, if you want governments to act, the only level of government that's really listening to you as a citizen is the members of parliament. The officials don't have to listen. They, they're told what to do by ministers. Ministers come and go. Uh, uh, you know, heads of government are hard to reach. Um, uh, it, the, the, the level that's listening is the members of parliament. Uh, we, if we leave it to the technocrats and bureaucrats and the diplomats in the UN and Geneva and New York negotiating on disarmament, let me tell you, we've been waiting for them to sort this out since Hiroshima, and that was some time ago, uh, and, and no progress has been made. I know the numbers are down a little since the Cold War, but we still have enough nuclear weapons to, to destroy the world many times over. I just wanna have one further point, just coming back to something Beatrice said uh, at the beginning of her very good intervention. She said, it's a nice feeling to, uh, to hear from, from people like Mary and me who were, were, were uh, uh, active in that upsurge of the peace movement in the 1980s. Uh, I, I just want to turn that around and say to Beatrice, but also to all the young people who are listening, and I'm sure many of the people listening into this uh, are students or younger people, 
uh, it's a nice feeling for us to know that you are all working on this. This is a multi-generational struggle. I was conscious when I was a young man in the peace movement uh, that, that the older generation in the movement were putting a lot of hope on me and, and my, you know, my, my fellow young activists. A, a lot of them living in America as I was in the 80s, uh, a lot of them were warriors who had been involved in World War II, who'd seen war up close, who'd been horrified. A lot of them had been actually bomber pilots, oddly enough, uh, among the, the group that I knew best, and uh, come back and said never again. They'd been deeply shocked by Hiroshima in a way a politician should be today by nuclear weapons, but they just got used to it. Um, and, uh, you know, we have to see this as a struggle that goes on generation after generation, just like the struggle to eliminate slavery. Pe many people lived and died campaigning against slavery and never saw the institution of slavery fall. Many people lived and died campaigning against colonialism and never saw the great empires fall. But the great empires would not have fallen if those people had not campaigned generation after generation. And I remember when Nelson Mandela came and gave a speech in the British Parliament, he thanked all those generations of British people in a very moving moment. He did not thank the conservative government that was hosting him, who had supported the apartheid regime. So uh, we have to see ourselves in, as part of a long, long movement that we may never see all our goals, in my case, I agree with the great jo Josef Rotblat, another Nobel Peace Prize winner, Nu nuclear disarmament is just step one. It's not going to hold unless we also demilitarize the planet and establish proper peacekeeping institutions. This is a long-term project and we have to be happy to commit ourselves to keep, keep going, even pursuing goals that we may never live to see. Thanks, I'm chasing your MPs. <laughs> So, I think I'd like to say three things. I mean, the first thing I want to say is that I think we shouldn't only be worried about what happens if there's a nuclear war, which of course is the worst thing that could possibly happen, and we should be worried about that. But I think the very existence, our day-to-day -day existence, is affected by the presence of nuclear weapons. And in particular, I think nuclear weapons stands for a very old fashioned absolutist conception of nationhood and a very male masculinist conception. You know, the very idea that we give our presidents or prime ministers the right to decide whether we live or die is just an incredibly old fashioned idea. And if we thought about it in any other context, we would say this is rubbish. On the contrary, the job of our president and our prime ministers is to look after us, not to kill us. But they have that right. I mean, the ones that have nuclear weapons, they're, they're allowed to decide to send a nuclear weapon as soon as they um, look at the fears we had about the nuclear codes being in the hands of Donald Trump. So, and what I think is, it, it's linked to a kind of very old fashioned imperialist politics. I mean, definitely here in Britain, it's linked to Brexit, which is very similar to authoritarian populism everywhere. There's an idea that there's a group of white men who love nuclear weapons and politicians don't dare challenge those white men. Um, in living in places like the north of England or in America, the Rust Belt. So nuclear weapons is bound up with this very authoritarian, absolutist idea of the nation state, which I think can't go anywhere in this interconnected world. And that's what I was trying to imply by what I was saying about COVID that actually we need, to, we don't want to get rid of nation states, but we need to supplant nation states by multilateral institutions or regional institutions like the European Union that already have a much more human security oriented type of approach to security. 
you know, you look at the UN or so we've got to become part of and, and lots of nation states are. So that's the first point I wanted to make. And I think somebody in the questions have asked a question about nationalism. But that also relates to Ukraine. I think if Ukraine had kept nuclear weapons, it probably would have been like Belarus. And maybe Russia wouldn't have intervened because it wouldn't have needed to. It would have remained a dictatorship. And it would have been extremely difficult to have the active civil society that you have in Ukraine today. Um, and I think linked to this is the fact that actually the Russians do recognize the impossibility of old fashioned war. And they've developed this concept of nonlinear war, which they played to perfection in Ukraine in which they argue you don't need to go to war in a classic sense. You can undermine a country by political, what they call political technology, which is the sort of interference in elections like in America or in Brexit, um, or, um, and through special forces. And that's exactly what they did in Eastern, in Eastern Ukraine. But they've even done it in Britain. Did our having nuclear weapons prevent them for from poisoning Litvinenko? Did it uh, prevent them from using um, novichoks uh, against the Scripples in Salisbury? I mean, this shows that what is the meaning of deterrence if actually we can't protect people? And in the case of Litvinenko, it was a sort of form of nuclear attack, actually. It was using a radiation weapon. So my view is, so, so my answer to the question is, um, is it might have prevented Russia, but it would have meant a Ukraine that's very different from the Ukraine today. And I'd finally like to say something about civil society, because it's something that I got very interested in as a consequence of my experiences in Eastern Europe. And what's the role of civil society? Again, I think we shouldn't be thinking in kind of linear terms in which civil society somehow influences governments or elected officials, and that's how we do it. Um, I think we should be thinking, I think from the beginning nowadays, civil society has to be transnational, just as the campaign that Beatrice led was transnational. But I think that was for us what the breakthrough was in END. I mean, we realised the problem wasn't just our own governments, the problem was NATO. And that if we wanted to change things in our society, we had to change things in a wider international, transnational, global context. And I think at the very same time that we were supporting East Europeans, American human rights activists were supporting people in Latin America challenging military dictatorships. And so I think civil society has a huge role to play in building multilateral institutions. And actually, if you think about the rise of human rights. It's actually the way civil society made use of declarations that has made human rights such a big issue. And what I'd love to be able to see, I mean, I think the achievement of the treaty to ban nuclear weapons was a huge achievement, but now what we need is civil society calling governments to account based on that treaty. We are beginning to see it in the arms trade. I know there are lots of people who are quite skeptical of the arms trade treaty, but actually I've seen in Britain, although it hasn't stopped it yet, the way NGOs and others have been able to use the arms trade treaty to challenge British arms sales to Saudi Arabia. So I think civil society has a huge role to play in kind of strengthening and helping to build international law and helping to shift us away from this nation state mindset towards a more multilateral world. And my feeling is that I don't know, I may be terribly optimistic, but this horrible right-wing authoritarian it, it, it's, is, is the kind of last gasp of the nation state, actually. Um, Hobsbawm, Eric Hobsbawm, the famous historian said, um, the owl of Minerva flies at night 
it's a good thing it's now circling around nations and nationalism. And I think with the pandemic, we are going to see a new phase of history, which if we get through, I mean, if, if we don't, all sorts of horrible things could happen. But, you know, if we are able to get through the pandemic, we will only be able to do so through strengthening the multilateral architecture. All right, thank you very much. I, I'm afraid we'll need to leave it at that. I know we, we've already uh, over overrun a bit. And I, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to uh, to everyone's uh, questions. Uh, clearly, this is something that we could discuss for, for much, much longer. Um, so thank you uh, to, to our three speakers for three fascinating talks and, and uh, to everyone uh, for attending and for sending in uh, your questions. Um, so uh, thanks, uh, thanks to everyone for attending and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much, bye. Well, thank, thank, thank you. you. It's been a real pleasure.